see you all here. I'm so glad you could all make it to our third installment of the Raising Happier Kids and Happy Parents 2 series. We're very excited about this series. Um, these series are designed to entertain and inform. They're sponsored by Woodbridge Township Addiction Services. Uh, this is a division of uh, Health and Human Services in Woodbridge Township. So this isn't an addiction program, but this is sponsored by Woodbridge Township Addiction Services, really just as a way of letting you all know that we exist. Um, addiction services makes a lot of difference in a lot of people's lives in Woodbridge. And if you know anybody who's, who suffers from substance use issues at all, please feel free to give us a call. Our phone number is all over the blue tablecloth up there, all of the merchandise, all of the, uh, the uh, flyers that you're going to find up there have the addiction services phone number up there. So if you know anybody who's struggling, have them call us. We can help. It's all free. It's all confidential. Um, just so you know, the fourth in our uh, Raising Happier Kids and Happy Parents 2 series will be on May 7th, Tuesday, May 7th. Um, Katie Hurley will be presenting, and Katie has written the Happy Kids Handbook, which is a, a great book, great best-selling book on parenting. Um, what this, the, this speaker that we have tonight is really very relevant to what we do in addiction services. She won't be talking specifically about addiction, but there's a lot of research indicating that adverse childhood events ACEs, we call them, field. Adverse childhood events put people at significantly higher risk for substance use disorders when they reach adulthood. So uh, several times more likely to have substance use disorders when they have adverse childhood events. So of course, sometimes bad things are gonna happen. These things happen and we can't protect our kids from everything, but there are things that we can protect our kids from. Uh, Amy Simon is an expert on um, helping us to figure out at what point do we shield our kids from things? How do we shield our kids from things and still let them exert their dependence and have a good life? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Amy Time. And Amy is renowned for her work on our series, Topic Raising Happy Kids. Her book, Doing Right by Our Kids, Protecting Child Safety at All Levels, is the number one best-selling parenting book. We are selling her book up there, so it's a very reasonable price of $10. If you'd like to get a copy of that, please feel free to get them while they're hot. Um, it's a best-selling parenting book, and I'm so pleased she was willing to travel all this way to share her thoughts with us, and I'm sure that you're going to enjoy this talk. So please welcome Amy Tyler. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for coming out tonight. I know it's uh, one of those nights when it could have been tempting to, to buck, bundle up and stay inside. So I really appreciate you all being here. Um, I'm Dr. Amy Tiemann and I'm from North Carolina. And, um, but I grew up in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. So I went to high school just not too far away from here. Um, and so tonight we're gonna talk about how we can empower our kids with the skills they need to explore the world with safety and confidence. Let me see if I stand on this side, if this helps with feedback. Because it does take skills, and it takes, um, it takes skills on the parent side, and it takes a lot of awareness and leadership on the adult side. And so we're all gonna be working together in partnership to help our kids explore the world. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, uh, I started out my career as a developmental neuroscientist. So when Bonnie talks about the ACEs study, that's very interesting to me. Um, I left research and went into teaching and taught high school in San Francisco um, and became a parent myself in 1999. So I'm happy to say my son's now 19 and in college. So I have raised a young adult. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, but really, I'm a teacher at heart and a parent at heart and so I wear many different hats so I'm not just looking at this as an expert I'm looking at it sitting in your seat sitting in your shoes raising kids and having participated in raising a whole lot of kids as a teacher um, this is my co-author Irene Bondersand I wanted to make sure to uh, give her a lot of credit we wrote doing right by our kids together very very thoroughly integrated partnership and Irene is the founder of an organization called Kid Power, which is pretty well known in California, uh, but actually works around the world teaching safety skills. And I brought the program to North Carolina in 2008. So this is a picture. We were finally together at my house signing finished books. We were so happy to be done. And we have our celebrating 10 years of Kid Power North Carolina t-shirts on. But Kid Power itself is actually celebrating its 30th year 
So this has raised a whole generation of kids. And what I love about Kid Power is it's very positive, it's very practical, and they have really done continuous improvement over 30 years. Uh, so we've worked hard to simplify things as simple as possible, but still being accurate, helpful, and true. And you'll see how that comes out in some of the details. Um, you'll see some of my slides are going to be Kid Power branded. That's because they are from Kid Power, and it's not just that I was, uh, you know, didn't want to <coughs> make all the slides look alike, but it's that actually, in order to use the Kid Power material, that's our agreement that that I make that very clear. So, um, pretty much every, just about everything I say tonight is in the book "Doing Right by Our Kids," and so if you want a deeper dive into any of it, it will be in the book. So, you know, parenting is, is really one of, you know, we say it's one of the hardest jobs in the world, and it really is. Uh, to me, the paradox of parenting is this, that good decisions made by our kids come from experience. But where does experience come from? Sometimes it comes from making bad decisions. Uh, this quote has been attributed to Mark Twain, but I can't figure out if that's really exactly true, so it's kind of lost to history. But this is so true. We, so that balance as parents and as teachers and as people working with children is we want to give kids enough experience that they have some wiggle room. You know, the, there's a great book called The Blessings of a Skin Knee by Wendy Mogul. And that's about, you know, you want to give your kids a chance to try things and maybe it doesn't work out. But we want to keep it within a safe realm so that um, we're not dealing with tragic consequences and that to me that balancing act and is one of the most important things to do as a parent. Now we kind of wish and hope that parenting and child development would look like this the onward upward straight path to greatness but it can kind of look a lot more like this sometimes if you guys remember the family circus comic Billy just is supposed to go out and get the mail it would should be a straight line out there and back but it's a curved path, it has detours, you have progress, you have setbacks. Uh, to me, that's what parenting is really like. So we're all in this together. And part of what's great about having a lecture series like this is you're developing community. You can see who else is interested in these topics. Oh, you know, maybe your neighbor's here, maybe your friend is here. And if you have questions a week from now, you can talk to them and uh, talk these things over, find out what they thought about it. And when it comes to child safety, having allies as advocates, if a problem comes up in your school or an organization you're part of, even just knowing one other person who's going to have your back and is willing to talk about this, these issues and willing to bring something up, uh, a problem that needs to be solved, is very, very powerful. Now, our, in Doing Right by Our Kids, our kind of our model for the book is protecting child safety at all levels. And so this means we start with family and your inner circle, like family, friends, family and friends, your neighborhood. And then we go out into all the organizations that are part of our lives. Schools, the larger community, we even talk about law enforcement. And then I happen to be really interested in laws and government and the Constitution. Um, we're not going to get up to that level tonight, but just know that, you know, there was actually a Supreme Court case about... Um, Something that happened in Chapel Hill, where I live, it was was a, a, ch a kid's locker, a high school student's locker, was searched, and it, they said it was an illegal search. So those kind of cases come up from time and again, and you can imagine other cases that involve laws. So I'm really interested at all levels, and our book is mainly for parents and teachers. It's also for people who run youth-serving organizations. But part of what gets me really excited is that all the change that's happened over the past few years with the Me Too movement and other kinds of improvements and reforms have really depended on grassroots energy coming from uh, parents, coming from college students, coming from church parishioners. Um, that bottom-up grassroots pressure is really, really important. The other way to look at this is what I'm starting to think of as full circle safety, because it's really important that we're putting child safety in a context of adult leadership, because at its heart, child safety is an adult responsibility. That's really, really important to remember, because we're going to be talking about skills that you can teach to kids as young as three years old, but 
we're not saying that a three-year-old or a five-year-old or even a 15-year-old should have to be taking care of themselves without a larger context. So that larger context is community, is you know, school principals taking bullying seriously. It's parents making sure that their kids know that they can come to them if they have a safety problem. So whatever we're talking about tonight, please always keep the adult leadership um, con context in mind. And so adults' job will be to be leaders and set good policies and good rules and make sure the rules apply to everyone and to try and have open lines of communication with kids. And then we're hoping to empower kids with skills and practice so they know if they have a safety problem that they can get help from a grown-up in their community. And I want to read a quick story that came into Kid Power from a special education teacher because this story really to me, this is, this is a story that made me come up with the term full circle safety. We teach different kinds of bullying prevention and problem solving, boundary setting, emotional safety, and physical safety skills to kids. But you'll see in, from this story how it's not enough to just teach it to kids. You need to have a larger conversation. So the teacher said, 16-year-old Morgan is on the autism spectrum and has a family with many challenges. My heart sank when he said in a trembling voice, I need help to throw away the words, I wish you had never been born. My mom keeps saying that to me, and it hurts. I thanked him for remembering the Kid Power lesson to keep asking until you get help. We use Kid Power's emotional safety tools to practice purging these cruel words from his heart and protect his feelings by saying, I'm proud of who I am. After just a few minutes, Morgan was sitting taller, smiling, and looking happy for the first time in many weeks. Yet I knew more was needed. I met with Morgan's mother, and I used Kid Power's intervention tools to explain with compassion how I understood that she felt overwhelmed by Morgan's situation, but how these words said in frustration were harming her son. Thank you for giving me the tools to help stop the emotional abuse that was taking away Morgan's joy. So there you can see that partnership, the teacher helping the student in the moment, but then knowing he needed to intervene with the mother so that this pattern could be broken. So that's the full circle safety that we are looking after. So our first most basic principle is our founding principle for Kid Power is put safety first. And honestly, if you, if you got one thing out of tonight and it was that concept of put safety first, that is actually something that can really change your life if you live by it. It's easy to say and it can be very, very hard to do. And that's why we're talking about it. So in its simplest form, this is something we'd like you to consider saying to the kids in your life and to yourself. I will put the safety and well-being of young people ahead of anyone's embarrassment, inconvenience, or offense. So how, like I said, easy to say, hard to do. Um, how many of you don't like being embarrassed? Raise your hand. How about you don't like to inconvenience other people? And you don't like to offend other people? Yeah, that's pretty much true for all of us, and it's even more true for kids. Bonnie, did you, did you have enough cards? I think I do. Okay, great. And honestly, you know, when you think about what gets in the way of safety, um, embarrassment, inconvenience, and offense end up being some of the biggest obstacles. So we're going to look at each of those what it looks like. So here is a situation that I am making my life's mission to try and win over the grandmas and grandpas of the world to be on the team who is willing to um, let kids decide if they want to give hugs and kisses. And it can be embarrassing. Maybe grandma came a long way to visit her family and the, her granddaughter doesn't want to hug when she gets there. And you can see the dad is a little flushed and embarrassed. So sorry, you know, she's like, give grandma a big hug. Sorry, she doesn't want you right now. She gets to choose. And I am not saying that grandma has any bad intentions necessarily in this case, but the principle behind this is that touch for play and affection should be the choice of both people. And if we want our kids to be able to set boundaries around touch, it's really powerful to model upholding those boundaries 
when we are all together. Because if we're saying, you know, if a teacher or a coach ever tries to break the safety rules and touch you in a way that breaks the rules, you need to say, you know, stop or I'll tell. It will be, you know, that's asking a lot of a kid. That's what we want kids to be able to do. But it's going to help them if when we're all together with our nearest and dearest, the people who love us the most, if we show them that, okay, you don't want to hug today, that's okay. Do you want a high five? Do you want to wave? Fist bump? And actually with, with parents, when you, see, when you know the situation is coming up, you can discuss it ahead of time or say, hey, do you have a toy you want to show them? Do you have some Legos that you've built or some pictures from our last trip or show them the dog's new trick? You can kind of think like, what can we do? And uh, you may have seen the viral video, which I really, really love, that is um, like a kindergarten classroom where every day the kids come in and there's a greeter and they have a hug, a high five, a fist bump, or a wave, and each kid gets to point to what they want and that's what they get. So I love seeing these examples. That's really teaching consent at a very, very young age. I love seeing these examples come to life. Inconvenience. Uh, Grown-ups are really, really busy. How many of you are busy grown-ups sometimes? How many of you even maybe get grumpy if you're interrupted and you don't know it's important? Yeah, I'm kind of guilty of that too. Uh, one thing you can do is to have kind of a family discussion about um, if, it's, if you want something, you have to wait. But if you have a safety problem, you get to interrupt. And the phrase you can say is, this is about my safety. So anytime your child says, this is about my safety, that's a cue that you need to put down the phone or the computer, whatever you're doing, and um, listen to them right away. So there's a dad on the phone. He's multitasking and watching his other younger son. But his older son says that, dad, I need to talk to you. This is about my safety. So hey, Carl, I'll have to call you back later. So that could be inconvenient. But what if there's uh, a fire in the kitchen? Do you think the dad would want to be interrupted? What if there is a strange dog outside that was, you know, maybe going to bite another child? Do you think he'd want to know that? Yeah. So the part of what's really important is that I want you to have an ongoing conversation about safety with your kids. It's not just a one-time discussion. Um, you can weave it in in little tidbits here and there, and we'll talk about how to do that when your child wants to do something that is a new activity. But you can do it in a way that's positive, it's not scary, and it's going to help your kids achieve their goals. And offense, here the checkout guy is really interested in this little girl's hair, and he maybe even wants to touch it. What pretty hair? And the grown-up says, please don't touch your hair. She doesn't like it. And the checkout man might be offended, but it's more important for her to be able to um, maintain her boundaries and her personal integrity. And offense can look like this, which can actually be really serious. Here, end of the night, someone wants to drive home but has had too much to drink. And so the people with her have to say, I know you feel you're safe to drive, but I feel worried about how much you've had to drink. Please let me have the keys and I will drive us all home. So that is a very, very important situation to not let offense uh, make you second guess yourself. So on the back of the Put Safety First commitment is the Kid Power Protection Promise. And we actually developed this uh, with parents and with teachers over the years and finally brought it together into one promise. And again, this is something to say to your kids and to hopefully put this card up somewhere where they can see it and to revisit it from time to time. So it is, you are very important to me. If you have a safety problem, I want to know. Even if I seem too busy, even if someone we care about will be upset, even if it's embarrassing, even if you promised you wouldn't tell, and even if you made a mistake, please tell me and I will do everything in my power to help you. So teachers can make this promise, grandparents, aunts and uncles, parents can make this promise to the kids in their life. So skills. Are, can often be the missing, missing ingredient in this kind of conversation. Uh, so these quotes, I'm going to show you two quotes that are what we put right at the beginning of our book. Uh, from Maya Angelou says, we knew then what we knew how to do, and when we knew better, we did better. And that's really why we wrote this book, because I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, 
my parents didn't really know to talk to me about these issues very much. And if I was taught anything, it was kind of like the stranger danger idea, which actually turns out not to be a very helpful framework at all. So I'm committed to helping uh, work with people like Irene, who's 20 years older than me. So she's kind of helped my generation learn better. And then teaching our kids and just paying it forward. And I think this is a really interesting time when people are willing to start having these conversations more and more. Um, and then the second thing that's important is from the Buddha, believe nothing, no matter where you've read it or who has said it, even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. So I want you all to be empowered to be powerful safety advocates. And it's going to take judgment and discernment and using your own common sense to go forward with this. So, um, you know, if people in power are not doing the right thing, um, you, can, you can tell that that's happening and you can demand that things change. OK, so to get into a few skills, first thing really is using your awareness. You're going to keep your radar on. You're going to pay attention. Um, this is important when you're crossing the street. You know, everything from basically like just watching where you're going and not having your face down in a phone so you don't trip and fall and get hit by a car in the street. But also for situations and people and people you're dealing with. Um, now I'm a neuroscientist, as I said. So when I say intuition, I don't mean anything that's like ESP. But what I do mean is that we are always getting lots and lots and lots of information in our brain and we can only really really pay attention to a little slice of it at a time. So to me, intuition is something that's coming kind of from maybe the periphery. Um, and the key is to be able to pay attention to it and not talk yourself out of it. So let me tell you a quick story about driving, because somehow I get driving stories with intuition. So I was driving on the highway one day, and I you know, was going like, on a 40 mile trip, it was just kind of a boring trip back and forth to Raleigh. And I just thought, I don't like that truck. So I'm on a pretty busy highway route 40. I don't like that truck. Now, I don't know why I thought that. I couldn't consciously tell you why I thought that. And if I hadn't been doing all this training, I might've thought, oh, I'm just being paranoid or, oh, why do I think that? I might've talked myself out of it. But since I've been working on these issues and even working on intuition, I was like, well, I don't like that truck, so I'm just going to get far away from it because no harm, right? Like, I'll just get away from it. And a mile later, that truck ran a car off the road. And so there are things we're picking up on, but sometimes when we don't understand it, our brain will t try and talk us out of it. So what I'd like you to consider is to, if you have an intuition that something's wrong about a person or a situation, to really ask yourself questions and really try to get to the bottom of it without talking yourself out of it. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about Gavin De Becker, who has written The Gift of Fear and Protecting the Gift, which is about child safety. And in The Gift of Fear, it's important to make a distinction between free-floating worry and a true signal. So here's some good news, is if you can turn down the worry, you know, worry is not helping anyone. I was flying on an airplane to get here, and if I was worried about the plane, was that, is that going to help keep the plane in the air? No, it wasn't. Um, I had a stepmom who said her job was to worry about everyone, and that didn't actually accomplish very much. So if you can turn down the volume of worry, that will actually help you hear true signals of fear or things you should be concerned about. And I also want to say that intuition and radar on, it, it's not um, snap judgments and prejudice. So this is not about seeing someone of a different group and thinking, oh, I'm scared because they're of a different group. This is about watching people's behavior and what's really going on and really being attuned to what's happening. So um, if you feel something, you want to follow through on it. Get more information if you can and get, you know, talk to other people if you need to. OK, so taking effective action, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but adult leadership is what is going to be needed to keep kids safe. That's protection, intervention, and advocacy. 
This illustration is a group of water buffaloes, and what they do with the little calf is the adult water buffaloes stand in a circle facing outward to protect the calf. So think about this when you're in organizations. Um, know what you're, you stand for and what the organization stands for. Split your attention to avoid tunnel vision. You want to be looking at a whole situation. Intervene if you see unsafe behavior. And it can be hard. You might be the only one who's willing to speak up, but that makes it even more important that you do speak up. Work together, advocate with other adults to create a safe and respectful climate. And incorporate skills into to your daily activities. Um, that's going to be really, really important with kids. And get help instead of going it alone. So use your intuition. Take effective action. And really, really important is avoid the illusion of safety. Don't automatically assume that someone is worthy of trust. Um, so if we talk about people who might want to hurt kids um, and commit sexual abuse, sexual predators usually start by cultivating a relationship of trust with schools, parents, or organizations before trying to get a child alone. And they can act generous, charismatic, fun to be with. They can be the most popular and favorite people in the organization. And they often start by grooming a child by pushing boundaries in subtle ways before doing anything overtly sexual. And so what I'm advocating for schools and other organizations to do is to make grooming behavior itself against the rules and reportable because that's the behavior that we are going to see most likely. Um, so grooming, you know, so when I say pay attention to attention, it's an adult should not be paying way, you know, way more attention to one kid than any others. And so the rules to, you know, uh, they, sh they should not be giving kids gifts. They should not be taking them on special trips. They should not be asking them to do one-on-one, -on -one, um, like coaching or extra, you know, alone time coaching or activities, unless there's a really, really good reason to do that. Um, they should not have games, favors, or anything else that would be a secret. Um, so that's what I'm recommending to organizations. And so if anyone, uh, if a school makes that rule, you would just have to report it. And I don't believe in like zero tolerance policies in general, I always think you need to like at, get to the root of something and find out what's actually happening. But um, if we can start looking for grooming behavior and seeing that as a really big red flag and getting to the bottom of what's happening, that is going to help prevent a lot of problems. Um, right now I'm doing a lot of work in North Carolina where there was a company that was a third party vendor for um, summer camps. So they would do summer camps at all the different schools. They would lead these kind of engineering camps for little kids. And um, one of their employees was arrested a couple months ago. And um, it's really hard to, it's, it hurts to see how much damage one person can do that basically entire like million person metropolitan area, you know, has been touched, um, has been affected by one person's actions. Um, but fortunately, they, the guy did get arrested. So that's one thing is, that is a challenge we're going to have to deal with is that when kids, we ask kids to report problems and we empower them to report, we are going to get more reports. And that's a good thing because that can stop the abuse. But it is a challenge for um, communities to go through. So again, the illusion of safety, um, you can't just go on reputation of an organization or a program or a person. And I want to give you some specific questions to ask when choosing any youth serving program. So this could be signing your child up for a summer camp or a martial arts program or um, music program, anything that is working with kids. So three questions. First, are the program leaders qualified to teach this activity? Let's say it's a martial arts dojo. So are they really, you know, do they have the background in martial arts that makes them expert enough to lead this activity? Second, do they know, know how to do it safely? And you're going to want to be asking some questions about this. You know, what are your safety procedures? Uh, 
what are your procedures if someone gets hurt? Are you trained in first aid? Um, anything that has to do with safety, and that's going to be different with different programs. If it's a youth, if it's a football camp, it might be questions about how many trainers do you have. Um, if you're training in the hot summer, you know, do you know about water breaks and avoiding overheating and things like that? And the third is really, really important. Do not assume this. This is, you really want to ask this question. Do they know how to specifically run this program for youth? Because a lot of times programs get started for many, many reasons. You know, let's go back to the dojo. There could be a martial arts dojo that runs for years with adults and they decide, oh, we're going to add a kids program. So they might be really good at martial arts and they might do it safely, but do they know the rules for interacting with kids? Um, and this really came up in North Carolina, probably came up all over the world, but since I live by, or all over the country, but I live by University of North Carolina, and they have so many sports camps in the summer. And so you hear Carolina basketball, Carolina soccer, sign my kid up for Carolina soccer camp. Um, it would be so easy just to say that reputation is so great that yes, I want to sign up for that. Um, but you know, that person, not to, literally pick on any one sport, but just for a hypothetical example, someone might be like a JV women's soccer coach during the year, but that doesn't mean that they know how to run a camp for eighth graders, especially if it's a residential overnight summer camp. So do they know about uh, you know, needing leadership with two adults present at all times? What about letting kids walk up you know, into the town? What about supervision? What about hours in a dorm? You, know, you can't assume that they know how to adapt the program to kids. Now, to UNC's credit, they realized several years ago, I think all universities across the country started asking themselves, do we have any kids on campus? That's literally where UNC had to start with this question, do we have any? And the answer was like 30,000 a year. So they did a study on it and finally like cataloged it all and put it all under one umbrella and are requiring training. So they're doing much better now, but even I think as of 2014, they didn't know how many programs they had for kids on campus. Now, if you're the planetarium, the planetarium knew they were a youth-serving program. But what if you had a high school student working in a biology lab? You know, you need to make sure the people in the lab know how to keep a young person safe. And what's really important is when you are doing your due diligence and possibly being a little annoying, but we're not going to let inconvenience uh, an offense get in our way, is you want to really observe how the people react to being asked about this, right? So if they act offended, if they act like, how dare you question my authority or question my qualification, that's not a good sign. So you want to know what they say, whether the answers are good answers, and how they respond to being asked. And a really good response would be, wow, thanks for asking about that. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. If they say, wow, I really haven't thought about it, that's also not a good answer. So um, this is a level of diligence you actually really want to do for any time you're signing up your child for an activity. OK, to get to my favorite concept from Gavin De Becker, who again wrote The Gift of Fear and Protecting the Gift, which is a really good book, and that's specifically about keeping uh, kids and teenagers safe, is it really helps to understand the power of the situation. And this is a concept from social psychology as well. Um, you want to analyze the situation. Anytime there is privacy and control, that makes it a higher stakes situation, um, just increasing like the risk that abuse can occur. And if you think about it, control, anytime you have like an adult child relationship, there's already a power differential there. So there's Control is kind of built in. So what we want to do is be looking at situations and um, trying to minimize or eliminate privacy as much as possible. So that's where you know, you'll hear the phrase too deep leadership. You'll hear that a lot in scouts and, other, and churches and other organizations. So ideally, you should have two adults with a group of kids at all time as much as possible, unless it's an emergency. If a, if a kid is the last kid at soccer practice and there's a miscommunication among the grown-ups and no one is there to pick that child up, you know, yeah, if you're the coach, you're not going to leave that child. 
that might be a one-on-one -on -one situation. But you, if that happens, you would want to obviously take care of the situation, but you want to be on the phone with all the parents, seeing if you could get them, probably on the phone with your supervisor, find, finding out what to do. Um, but that should be an unusual situation. So you want to minimize privacy as much as possible. Um, in schools, there are a lot more attention with architecture to having some windows, even internal windows within, within the building. And I'll tell you that when I was a high school teacher, I just learned how to manage this like a second nature. I had a, uh, my chemistry classroom was like a big classroom that had this glassed in kind of fishbowl office in it. And so if I needed to, to tutor a student, if there was a class going on in the bigger room where the other teacher was, you know, could see us sitting in the fishbowl, I would tutor in that office. But if it was after school or there was no other class going on, I wouldn't meet a student one-on-one -on -one in that more private situation. I would say, let's meet in the library, let's meet in a conference room. You can still have um, kind of a personal conversation, even maybe on a bench out in the field during recess but you want to keep things observable and interruptible, even if you want to need to have a somewhat, uh, you know, more private conversation with a student. But the good news is I, that literally just became second nature. Once you know these principles, you can just start applying them and it doesn't have to take like a lot of extra time and effort as long as you're thinking about it. Okay, I want to read a couple of situations. And see, okay, so I'm going to read these out loud. Sometimes I pass these out, but we have a nice big group out tonight, so I'm just going to read it out loud. And so if you can, I'm going to read it out loud. If you can talk to the person next to you about, um, like, what are the privacy and control aspects of the situation? Um, what might make it hard to speak up and do something? And how embarrassment, inconvenience, or offense might factor into it? Um, and think about how you could take charge of the situation. So first one is, you are a father taking your 13-year-old daughter to a dermatologist. You expect it to be a routine checkup, but the dermatologist sees a suspicious spot he's concerned about and asks to do a full body exam with photos to document the moles. So take a second to think about that. And let's just experiment with talking to the person next to you about that situation, why it would be hard, and um, how do you think you could take charge of it, even if it was hard? OK, what do you think? I know we don't have a ton of time tonight, so I want to make sure you keep going. Would anyone like to volunteer your, what you think about this one? Yes. Okay, great. That's some really good best practices there. Good ideas. What else? Because it's still your choice, right? Yeah. Here, do you want to? We will also ask my child. Yeah. If it was our daughter, we were talking about that. We will ask her, do you feel comfortable having the doctor, if male or female, what we should say, if it was a girl or female, of course, you know, and, but ask also the child, do you feel comfortable um, with me inside the room, you know, with the doctor? You know, they, they have to check you. Do you feel comfortable alone or should we be in there with you? To think about that to ask the child for their opinion what, what do they think great because maybe she would be okay with it today and maybe you really need to reschedule and there is yeah. the health yeah. yeah I would actually say that at this time right now I like to reschedule and then I'll go home and Google to see if these things are actually mm -hmm. done I yeah. try to ask other doctors I'm like you know, would you recommend this or not get another opinion Great, second opinion, or maybe reschedule schedule another day. Maybe, you know, maybe her mom had been planning to take her and at the last minute scheduling changed and it just, you know, maybe today is just not the day. And I do definitely hear the concern about you don't want to let a health problem go, but you want to have the balance of knowing it is your choice if we do it today, even if it means speaking up to a doctor, which can be really, really difficult and ha can have embarrassment, inconvenience, and offense all kind of wrapped into one in that example. 
But to know it is your choice, you can change your mind and hit the pause button. That's one of my favorite concepts. Um, you don't have to just like keep moving forward with something because you started it. I just want to do one more really quickly and we're going to keep moving on. So you're a first year college student who's excited to be at a party with a cute guy in your class. You like him a lot um, and you're talking to him at a party. You want to get to know him better. At the end of the night, end of the party, he says, I'm gonna, he offers to walk you back to your dorm room to keep, help keep you safe walking across campus. And then he gets to the dorm room and you go to say good night and he asks to come in and see your room. And you say, I had a really good time tonight, but you know, I'm just gonna call it a day. And he says, come on, we're having such a good time. I'll just come in for a minute and I promise I won't try anything. <laughs> so just think. <laughs> okay, no, and, and why, and what would no, make that hard? <laughs> um, I would just say no thank you. Okay. I don't think that's hard. I don't, it's <laughs> kind of coming in and out. So that can be really hard because especially it's someone you like, and it even starts out saying, I'm going to walk you home to keep you safe. But then once you get to the dorm room, if you go into a private situation, that is now escalating now we're in privacy and control. You're in a locked dorm room with someone that's a much, much, just totally different situation than walking across campus with them. So, but you can see how that would be hard. And when I was a high school teacher, this situation was like the hardest thing for them to imagine. Um, even having someone ask you out that you don't want to go out with, they just felt like it was really hard to say no to them. So this is one of those just really hard intersections of what young people are kind of ready to do and what they need to do to keep themselves safe. Um, but you can imagine, especially like now with the world of internet dating, there are kind of some best practices people can have, like you know, meeting at a coffee shop and not exchanging too much personal information, having your, you know, keeping a date in public and having your own transportation home. Those are some things you can do to minimize privacy and control. Okay. Um, so who here has kids younger than eight years old? Just raise your hand. Cool. Who has kids older than eight years old? And you can have both. Okay, good. All ages. I just want to say really quickly, our, with Kid Power, we have a positive practice method. This is really, really important and really distinctive about our program uh, and our whole approach. And again, these turn out to be skills to live by. I love these skills because I use them every day. I use them in shaping healthy relationships and also to prevent bigger problems. But we are going to be positive and use fun, not fear, to teach kids. We're going to empower them without scaring them. Be specific and keep it simple. So one of our rules is check first. And we'll say you're going to check first before you talk to a stranger. Check first before you take something from a stranger. Uh, check first before any time you change a plan. So we're going to keep it really, really simple. We could sound like a broken record, but that's actually really good because if you remember check first, you're remembering a lot of information in just two words. Um, we want to be consistent in what we say and what we do. So if we say that if you have a safety problem, please interrupt me and I will help you, we need to actually follow through with that. And that's part of what creates full circle safety. And really importantly, we keep it emotionally safe. We teach about stranger safety, not that other phrase I don't even want to say again. And we teach about boundaries, uh, not good touch or bad touch, because good touch, bad touch can be really, really confusing. And boundaries is just a more helpful and accurate way to frame it. And we don't just show and tell, we practice. And this boy is practicing calling 911. So that's one of the things we practice is if you have, you know, if you need help, what do you call? 911. When we've had some, we actually will have phones to practice um, what that looks like. And one kid said, 911. But will you tell me what a nine looks like? <laughs> so we teach some really young kids. I just want to see what comes after this. OK. Um, I could spend an hour talking about this. Obviously, we don't have an hour to talk about this slide. But it's really important to kind of know that in order to stop um, abuse, there's not just one 
one size fits all solution or one skill that kids need to know. They actually do need to know kind of a constellation of skills, recognizing safe and unsafe behavior, knowing what the safety rules are, setting boundaries in a powerful and respectful way to stop inappropriate or unsafe behavior. We are going to spend some time practicing that. Leave a potentially dangerous situation as soon as they can. Protect themselves from hurtful words and behaviors. So emotional safety too is really, really important. And if we can learn to keep ourselves safe emotionally, that's good for ourselves and it can actually also help like things like help keep fights and arguments from escalating. Resist emotional coercion and social pressure. Uh, be persistent in getting the attention of busy, distracted adults in order to get help and defend themselves from an assault with physical skills if necessary. And martial arts and things like that are great. I actually study martial arts. I really, really love it. But in terms of self-defense, you don't have to be a martial artist. You don't have to have a black belt. We found that some very simple training, like one strong physical move can solve, uh, can, can stop most attacks. Okay, so what I want to do is, this is really important, so I want to cover this. Um, six steps to prepare children for more independence, and then I want to talk about boundaries, and I want to talk about emotion, emotional safety, and I'll take your questions. Okay, so this is where like the skills coming in is really important, because how many of you have heard the concept of free-range kids? Like, a lot of people want kids to have more freedom, and that's great. But how do you get there? What do kids need to be able to know in order to do more things safely? And so we can actually break it down into six steps. So this can be if your child wants to go on their first sleepover, overnight party, or if they want to walk to school for the first time, or they want to go to the mall with their friends, or go to the movies with their friends, or go camping. Um, we're going to break it down into six steps. So make realistic assessments. This means knowing your child and knowing the situation. Um, so really important to know your kid. And only you know your kid the way a parent can, can know them. Because you know, you know you can tell them the rules. And you want to think about how well they follow the rules, um, how impulsive they are, how distractible they are, how you know, if you have a plan, are they going to stick to the plan? And also assessing the situation, um, which we'll get to in co-piloting. Um, as you're going along, you're going to teach about safety in ways that build confidence, not fear. So you can use this as saying, OK, you want to walk to school, or you want to walk to your friend's house. Let's go through a process to make that possible. You want to learn, practice, and coach the use of people safety skills. So if your child is doing the overnight uh, slumber party, do they know that they can call you any time to have you come pick them up? Would they you know, feel comfortable? Would they be able to actually, in, a, in a, you know, another family's house, pick up the phone and call you? Um, do they know how to use a landline? You know, do they have their own phone with them? There are a lot of things we need to remember to not just take for granted. Um, I think there's some kids who don't have, you know, a lot of kids don't have landlines. So if you, there's a really great YouTube video of kids using a rotary phone, like teenagers trying to use a rotary phone and figuring out, like, what is this thing? It's really funny. Co-piloting to field test skills in the real world. So co-piloting means that you, you know, walk the route to the friend's house together. And it's really important to see that. In, so maybe you're not, you know, you're not micromanaging them the whole time. But you're kind of walking it together, finding out like, oh, is there, was there a mean dog that lives at a certain house that isn't well controlled? You want to know about that. Is there construction? Is there a busy street? Is there a light on the busy street? So you want to actually do the activity, co-piloting. Maybe you go to the mall and your kid's there with their friends and you, you know, go to a different store and meet up with them a short time later. And similarly, conduct, conducting trial runs with adult backup, that's for like a little bit of a bigger activity. Um, like if your kid wanted to go camping with their friends, um, there was a good example from a family in California who did that. And the kids thought, you know, the teenagers really wanted to go camping on their own. And they'd been camping before, but they'd never been without their parents. So what the mom did was she got a campsite 
on like the next loop over. So she didn't, they couldn't see her and hear her. She wasn't right there with her flashlight, but she was nearby. And the kids found out that camping is a lot of work, but it was successful, but they had that adult back up there if they needed it. And keeping communications open with ongoing listening checkup and review because things can change. And we had one story that really stuck with me about a girl who really liked to go to her friend's house for sleepovers. She'd done it a whole bunch of times. It was kind of the thing they did. But then her friend's parents were getting divorced and they were fighting a lot and it got really scary. And so um, she had to tell her parents, you know, this, this just doesn't feel safe anymore. Can we do something else? And instead they invited the friend to come over to their house. So things can change. You always want to keep checking in and you know, a lot of this boils down to not making assumptions, even with your child. So are there any questions about this in particular? Because I think this is really, really important. And they're actually in the back of the book. Um, the gray section is like 50 pages of kid power skills. And the article that fully describes this is actually in the book. And that is my favorite article that made it into the book. Okay, I do want to talk a little bit about boundaries because boundaries, setting personal boundaries is a tool that we can use to shape healthy relationships. Um, you know, all of us could benefit from being able to communicate what we want more clearly and to ask the other people in our, li our lives to respect our boundaries and for them to be able to ask us to respect their boundaries. Um, when we're talking about this with young children, we keep it really, really concrete. We say, you know, what are boundaries? What are the boundaries in this room? The boundaries would be the walls and, and the windows. And, you know, there might be lines on a sports field or lines on a road or boundaries. And here is a fence that keeps the dogs safe from the cars and the people walking by safe from the dogs. But those are boundaries we can see, but they're also boundaries we can't see, but we can feel. So how many of you have ever been like, playing a tickling game or roughhousing game and it was fun, but then it, like, it got rough and it wasn't, got too rough and it wasn't fun anymore. Has that ever happened? Or you're telling, jo people are telling jokes and it's, everyone's having a good time, but then someone tells a joke that's really personal, like hits too close to home. That's your emotional boundaries being crossed. And so there are four boundary rules that we live by. Rule one is we each belong to ourselves. I belong to me and you belong to you. That means your body and also your thought, your emotions, and your time. But some things are not a choice. This is where when I say we've spent a lot of time making things true and accurate, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about because some things are not a choice. Um, Going to bed is not a choice at bedtime. Taking a bath is not a choice. And touch for health or safety is not always a choice. If a kid falls down and breaks their arm and goes to the doctor and they need to get a cast on it, is it a choice to get a cast or not? Not really. It's, they, they need to um, get that cast. But as we'll see, it should never be a secret. Even if touch is not a choice, um, it should never be a secret. But so touch for health or safety may not be a choice. And this can get really profound. I mean, there are kids who have to have physical therapies or treatments that are painful and um, that they have to endure and manage. And that can be really hard. But we do want to let those kids know they can talk about it. It shouldn't have to be a secret, even if it's not a choice. So problems should not be secrets. Gifts should not be secrets. Games, trips, favors should not be secrets which is different than a surprise. If you get a, you know, if you bought a birthday present for your grandma and everyone's gonna know about it at her birthday, that's a surprise, that's okay. But kids should not have to keep secrets. And we practice keep telling until you get help. So, you know, in a classroom setting or with parents, we'll say, you know, ask your kids, like, who are three people you could talk to if you had a problem? And, uh, in North Carolina, we had a success story where a girl was having something scary was happening at home. She came into school, and one day the principal was in the pickup line, and she tried telling the principal, and he didn't realize she was saying something really serious. 
She went inside, she told a caf person working in the cafeteria, and they weren't able to help her, and she told her classroom teacher, and her teacher was able to help her and get uh, the counselor involved in a very uh, serious situation. So that really struck with me because even to think you might tell the principal and, it, and you might still need to tell a person beyond that, we all get busy, we all get distracted. It doesn't mean that person had bad intentions, but they didn't understand what she was telling them. So keep telling until you get help. And we also say practice telling the whole story. And then we have a consent checklist. So consent is a huge topic right now. And I worked on the Title IX task force at the University of North Carolina to rewrite all of the university's policies responding to sexual assault. And I'll tell you, in all these discussions about, that we were having about college students, I kept thinking about these basic rules in our consent checklist, which we teach to kids as young as three years old. Again, ongoing conversation. You're not going to tell a three-year-old something and then wait, you know, not say anything for 15 years and expect them to remember it. But as part of an ongoing conversation, we can start this consent checklist at a very, very young age. And I just kept thinking, man, if these students had had this conversation for their whole lives, it would sure be a lot easier to talk about it when they were in college. So this is simple, but don't underestimate it. It's very powerful. So touch for play, fun, or affection. It has to be four things. It has to be safe. It has to be the choice of each person, OK with both. It has to be allowed by the adults in charge. So if I was at my house with a friend, and I was eight years old, we were both eight years old, and we thought, oh, you know, we're going to make ice cream sundaes. It'd be really fun to have a food fight with our ice cream. And we would say, well, that's our choice, and that's safe. But would that be allowed by the grown-ups in charge? No. no. That would be against the rules, so it would not be OK. And it has to be not a secret, which means that other people can know. And um, there is a Kid Power comic book, which is available. All the Kid Power books are available on Amazon.com. And there's a lot of free information on the kidpower.org website, including a downloadable free comic uh, coloring book that would have rules like this in it. Um, so I would love to do a quick boundary setting practice to show you how we can put some of this into action. Would anyone like to volunteer to help me? It's not going to be too scary. OK, great. Come on up. OK. All right, what's your name? David. David, OK. Thank All right, let's you. give David a hand. OK, so David, let's say you're eight years old, okay. and I'm your babysitter. I babysit you a lot. You're some, I'm someone, you know, we like each other. We have a good time together. And um, we've just been out playing, and I'm kind of tired, and I'm like, oh, oops. I'm like, leaning over, I'm like, oh, I just need to lean on for you for a minute. Now, if, if David likes this, is it okay for me to put my hand on his shoulder, if he likes it? Yes. Yeah. Um, but he can change his mind. So let's just say you don't like that for whatever reason. So you're going to give me my hand. Good. Give me my hand back. Take your hand. Give me my hand back, and say, "Please stop." Please stop. And hopefully that would work. So good job. But do you ever notice that sometimes people don't listen to you the first time you say something? They don't hear you. So I'm just like, ah, oh, hand comes back again. So now he's going to need to set a stronger boundary because I didn't listen. So give me my hand back. Take a step back. Make a fence. Please stop. Great. And hopefully that would work. But what if the person, the babysitter said, stay, you can stay right there. What if I said, oh, but David, I thought I was your favorite babysitter. I thought you liked me. Why can't you just be a little more friendly? Ooh, could that be hard to have your favorite babysitter say that? Yeah, that's introducing some emotional coercion. And what the, what the kid can do is you listen to what they say and you kind of repeat it back to them. So you, you can say, you are my favorite babysitter. You are my favorite babysitter. And stop. And stop. Great, and good job. And an easier, oh, but we're not done yet. Uh, Please stop. No. Yes, uh, and you can also say sorry and stop, um, if that's easier to remember. So again, hopefully that would work. But the next escalation would be breaking the safety rules. So what if the babysitter said, 
I'll tell you what, David, if you can just be a little more friendly and let me put my hand back on your shoulder, I will take you out to get ice cream and you can get all the ice cream you want with as many toppings as you want if you just let me keep touching your shoulder. Ooh, does anyone know what that's called? What's it called when you trade something like that? Bribe. <laughs> bribe. Now, there are some safe bribes. Like if the teacher says, if we get this room cleaned up really fast, we can get five more minutes at recess. That's, you know, something we do all the time, and that's okay. But bribes for touch are never okay. That is breaking the safety rules. So if the babysitter says that, I want you to say stop or I'll tell. Stop or I'll tell. Ah. Well, who are you going to tell? Mommy and Daddy. Um, you better not tell. We're going to both get in really, really big trouble, so I want you to promise not to tell. Ooh. So what I want you to say is, I won't tell if you stop. I won't tell if you stop. Good. And then what is David going to do as soon as he gets away from this person? Tell. tell. tell okay. So good job. So we can kind of, we can do this as a group. I want to just go through it again as a group. Pretend this is my hand on your shoulder. Put your hand on your own shoulder. Pretend that's someone else's hand. You don't want it. If you want it there, maybe, you know, it's, it could be okay. But you don't want it. You don't want it there. You give it back and say, please stop. Please stop. But it comes back again. So you're going to, the person didn't listen. You're going to give it back. Make a fence. Pretend that you stood up and took a step back and say, I said stop. Oh, but you're really hurting my feelings. I thought we were friends. You can say, we are friends. We are friends. And, stop. and stop. All right, I'll tell you what. If you'll just let me keep touching your shoulder and be a little friendlier, I'll take you on an all-expense-paid trip to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and that might be, I say that because that might be what the ice cream bribe feels like to kids. This can be really, really hard. A bribe can be very powerful. So, but a bribe is breaking the safety rules, so say stop or I'll tell. You better not tell, we're going to get in a lot of trouble. And I want you to say, I won't tell if you stop. And then what are you going to do as soon as you can? Tell. Great. Give yourselves a hand. So two quick things. That was really, really good. Um, I won't tell if you stop. We say that because that identifies the child as someone who can tell. And our goal in that moment, assuming that child is with this person of authority and they can't get away, is that, you know, if it's a babysitter, it might be, you know, two hours until their grown-ups come home. So we want to stop this boundary-breaking behavior in its tracks. And so I won't tell if you stop is to de-escalate it. And then we tell kids, we want you to tell the truth most of the time, but this is where you as their grown-ups, really it's powerful when you deliver this message, but grown-ups, do you agree if your kid ever had to tell an emergency lie to get out of a safety problem, would that be okay? Yes. And then tell as soon as you, you can. So um, that's a demonstration that got me really interested in kid power to begin with. It actually has so many layers in it. Um, it can be very, very powerful. Now, the misuse of power, the bribe, the misuse of power, um, where I offered the bribe, it could be also be something like, I'm a grown-up, and you have to do what I say, or I'm your boss, and I'm going to, you know, get you in trouble if you don't do it. Um, could be all sorts of different misuses of power in there. Yes? I just want to say something. I mean, that sounds, it, it's perfect what you're saying, but it's so hard to explain that to kids from other cultures. You know, here, yes, I'm pretty sure, and kids are born and raised, you know, in this country, it's very easy for them to understand because parents here, that's, you know, they teach them that since they're little, but when we come from other countries like that, we would, we're, we're so used to, to touching, being so close to each other, and trusting people, or mm -hmm. if you go to church, the priest, that, that's God, he's close to God, you know, you trust him so much, or, or the adult, you know, you have to respect them. If, when you have, kids from other countries to teach them that. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's hard mm -hmm. you know, to, to, you know, to try to break that custom, you know, from the country. Well, it is hard, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, if you're from another country, to mm -hmm. teach that to a kid that, that just came here a few years ago, to try to teach them that, it takes some time. It's, yeah. it's, it's not impossible. We can do it, you know, but... That's where teaching it within 
you know, people within the culture, within the community, teaching it is very powerful. That's where reinforcing it, practicing over time is really powerful. And so it's actually hard in so many cultures. Um, I come from a Midwestern white Protestant background and this was a really big deal in, in my family's culture too. It was really hard to talk about safety problems, really hard to talk about um, secrets and authority, but um, we had to learn a lot about doing that. Yeah, and yeah, the example with the babysitter that you were saying, that just a simple touch like that for somebody, for a kid in my country, that's nothing. That's yeah. Nothing. So we don't even, Well, I don't want to say that we don't worry, but we don't, maybe years ago, okay. Maybe we didn't think that was wrong. Now, I mean, I've been here for, for a long time. My kids are, were born and raised here, so I'm teaching them that way. But I see other kids, you know, when they come here for the first time, yeah. it's not the same, you know. It's, it's really scary. I'm, that's what I'm thinking right now. And when we practice, we're practicing with a very innocuous touch on purpose, just so that it is not scary. Mm -hmm. But um, this can obviously, I mean, it can apply to situations that are breaking the safety rules around touch for private areas, for example. But we would never practice something yeah. even remotely uh, scary. So we want to practice. Just pick any kind of touch that is that is uh, not going to be too intense, just to get the concepts across. But th but again, pra you know, we have that's just where introducing it from within your community can be so so powerful, and using some of you know interweaving it with some of the other things about, well, what skills do we need to, you know, for our field trip? We need to stay together, we need to pay attention. So it's all kinds of life skills mixed together. I want to make sure we have time for a couple questions, so. Just a quick question. What would you do in a situation if a teacher is being inappropriate and you've gone to her superior and she's still being allowed to teach and be around children? Um, what would your next step be? Like, what would That can be really frustrating, and I would say just you have to be really persistent okay. and keep it. If there is a higher chain of command, if there's a superintendent um, or someone else in the system, um, keep pursuing it. And for independent schools, I mean, and there, there have been times when really changing schools is necessary, and I hate to say that because I know that's a really hard choice to make, but. Yes. Quick question on peer pressure. Like mm -hmm. uh, when there are adults doing inappropriate things to kids, it's a lot more obvious. But when kids amongst themselves watch TV or whatever and mm -hmm. try to think something's appropriate due to their curiosity, how do you teach those things as part of safety? I would, you know, make it clear what the rules are that you would like to uphold, you know, what are your limits on what you want them to be watching or not. And just try to keep checking in and see if, see how that's going. And also to let them know, you know, if, if they did break a rule and watch an R-rated movie or something that was really scary or really upsetting, like, you want to know, right? So like, if my kid did that, I'd, I would want him to come and talk to me about it to process through the feelings and I would, you know, that would be my primary concern. And then secondary would be the rule breaking part of it. Like, it's kind of like the part of, if you ever need me to come and get you home from a party, call me, I'll come get you first and then we'll talk about the consequences second. I, I, I'm not sure, I think I understood the question differently than, okay. and maybe I'm wrong, but I think the question had to do with when two kids are interacting and there's inappropriate touching, is that what you meant? Oh, touching or? Yeah, I, well, they're watching oh. TV together or something like that and thinking something's appropriate and, you know, experimenting that way. How do you, how do you explain that in the context of safe touching when it's kids and not adults? Okay, I'm sorry, I was misunderstanding the question. Um, you know, the safety rules do apply to everyone. So, um, the la let me just say really quickly, I want to just tell you how we, because this will get to your question, how we teach the safety rules about private areas. And again, we've made this as simple as possible while still being true and accurate. 
Um, you may want to add more language to this than what we would say right now, but I want just this is how we would teach it in a school and what has been acceptable in a wide variety of cultures and schools. So the safety rules about private areas are that private areas are the parts of your body that are covered by a bathing suit. For player teasing, other people should not touch your private areas. They should not ask you to touch their private areas either. They should not show you videos or pictures of people in private areas, and they should not ask to take any pictures or videos of your private areas. And so among kids, um, it's kind of depends on the age. I mean, very young kids, um, looking to see what different bodies look like, I would say is within the realm of pretty normal. Um, as kids get older, they should be able to um, abide by these rules and they should, um, it also depends on like the severity or extent of the behavior. And since there are kids in the audience, I don't want to have like a big conversation about this. Um, but this is a general rule. And so anything that breaks that is something to talk about. And if you have any concerns about the extent of that, that would be a good time to talk to a guidance counselor um, or a counselor and just to get more information about it. Did that answer your question? Okay. Um, and so we do have social stories and comic books for younger kids that show a lot of different examples. Um, you know, here's, let's take off our clothes so we can play doctor. And his friend says, that's against our safety rules. We can play doctor with our clothes on. Um, and do I need to wrap up like now or like five minutes from now? It's fine. What are you doing? Okay, good. Cool. Um, I wanted to get back to our emotional safety techniques because that is really, really important. I mean, emotional well-being is just as important as physical well-being. And the thing is, if kids get mean words or negative thoughts stuck in their heart, it can stay there for a really, really long time. And so we've come up with some emotional safety techniques that can be really helpful. Like in the story in the beginning with the boy who uh, was getting help with the cruel words he heard from his mom. So trash can power is something we would say to uh, younger kids, like elementary and younger. And so we say, uh, you always have a, you actually have been carrying a kid power trash can around the whole time and you just didn't know it. So if you put your hand on your hip, that makes the opening of a trash can. And if someone says something mean, that's like a piece of trash. And so if you have a piece of trash, well, the little kids, I'll throw a towel on the ground and I'll say, what's this? It's trash. Do I eat it? No. Do I put it in my pocket? No. Do I put it in my purse and take it home? No. Where does it belong? In the trash can. So um, we always say we're pretending. If we say a mean word, we're pretending so we can practice. So if someone says, you're stupid, you're going to catch that word, throw it in the trash can, and then put your hand on your heart and say something nice to yourself. Like, I'm smart. Or I just need a little more time or mistakes are part of learning. That's a really good one for grown-ups too. Mistakes are part of learning. Um, and what if someone says, you're doing a great job today. What if I caught that and threw it in the trash can? Uh-oh, what did I just do? Threw away a compliment. So we want to take compliments in. So if someone says, you're doing a great job today. Thank you for being here. You can just say, thank you. Make sure you take that in. Don't throw away a compliment and don't take trash in to your heart. Um, we also have some other techniques that I really like. Um, the screen door technique. What does a screen do on a screen door? It lets in air and keeps out bugs and flies. So what if a teacher was, me was just really grumpy one day and said, you are the laziest group of students. None of you have your reports done and they're due tomorrow. You can use the screen door to filter out lazy, but there was still some important information, right? What was the important information? It's due tomorrow, because it's still due tomorrow. So I really like that one. There's also the emotional raincoat. You can picture you have a raincoat on, and um, if you're in a situation where you have to, you know, if, if someone's saying unkind words to you, it's better if you can leave, but there might be a case where you know, a tense Thanksgiving dinner, for example, where you're just going to be around someone who pushes your buttons. You can just pretend you have 
a raincoat on, so those words don't really touch you um, and don't affect you as much. And the final idea with that is adjusting emotional distance. I think it's a really helpful concept. If you have a friend, you know, I think we all have friends in our lives or people we know who most of the time they're great, but sometimes it's just too much. Um, you can adjust your emotional distance by um, refu you know, declining to get into a really involved conversation. You can say, I really care about you. I can see you're upset. We can talk about this another time. Um, and there may be times when you want to spend less time with, with a friend than other times when you're getting along well. So it's OK to adjust your emotional distance. Now, of course, with any of these things, if a young person is having persistent problem with um, emotional attacks of any kind or persistent problem with friends or with family, we want them to get help. But some of these emotional techniques can really help in the moment to just get to the next moment where maybe things are better. And we've even had teachers say that they've seen the fight that didn't happen in their classroom, where there might be two kids who are always kind of mixing it up and getting into you know, an argument. And they've seen the kids kind of start to head that way. And one kid puts on his mouth closed power. The other kid puts on his walk away power. And they go their opposite directions. And the fight doesn't happen. So these can be really good classroom management techniques. And also intervention can just take a second. I was a parent at a school picnic a few years ago. Um, I was just there as a parent. I had no authority. I wasn't a teacher there. But there was a girl and a boy who were running around. And just like we were saying, like they were having fun at first. But then the girl you know, was getting annoyed by him. And she said, stop. And they were running by me. And the boy went out with his hand and was going to hit her. And I just put my hand up. I just caught his arm and said, she said, stop. It literally took one second, but it worked. So that's why I encourage you to really think about how you can intervene, how you can be a powerful leader, or powerful adult, because you all have incredible gifts to give our community. And so you know, think about the things we said tonight. Think about how you can use them. And this is just a picture of I want to end with a picture of Irene making it really, really concrete with a real trash can with a group of Head Start kids. We've even seen teachers make a kid power trash can where kids, if they have, they want to throw something away, they can make a drawing of something that's bothering them or write the words up and, on a piece of paper and then like tear it up and throw it in the trash can. We'll even see kids go up to the trash can and pick it up and yell some mean words into it that they don't want to yell at their friends. So. Um, can be really creative and really concrete, and you never know what kids are going to do. So I think that's what we're, we have time for tonight. But I just really want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's really a pleasure uh, to come to your community. And I hope you'll uh, learn more at my website or at kidpower.org. Kidpower.org has a huge library of free resources. It's almost overwhelming. but. Um, any question you have, they would have a lot of answers in there. Um, but so thank you so much for having me.